Okay, good afternoon, everyone. If we're ready, we will begin. Um, Genoa is here, the other cities are um, in, in Madrid and they're connected. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gloria Piaggio. I work for the municipality of Genoa. I'm in charge of the Smart City. I'm Smart City co Coordinator and I'm in charge of European projects. So um, the scope of uh, my talk today is to give you an idea, an overall idea of what a smart city is, because we hear this uh, spoken about everywhere, and uh, uh, it, it is interesting to see what it means and to see how Genoa, and not only Genoa, but the European Union, uh, are approaching this uh, strategic uh, topic, which is in fact in the title. So 
uh, I will not speak specifically on ports, but I will give you an idea of how this is integrated within the planning, uh, the overall planning of the city's growth. Um, we have two hours, right? Somebody out of here. Okay. So, uh, Please uh, feel free to interrupt, okay? Um, if there are, you have any questions or there's something you have not understood, please feel free to, to say so, both here in Jena and in the other cities. And um, if you're bored, uh, raise your hands and I'll try to make it a little bit lively. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, let's start saying that the smart city does not have a specific definition. So there is not a standard uh, definition of what a smart city is. So, um, if this technology is helping me. Um, so, let's start looking at this interesting graph that you see here. On the left side, on the Y, you see uh, the Human Development Index. It's an index that the UN has developed to measure, uh, in a sense, the level of happiness, how people live. There are many indexes, so this is just as good as any. And uh, on the axis, we see uh, the um, ecological footprint, that is how much planet we each use. So if we all move like the United States, going up to the top right, where you see uh, you, we have an, uh, a very high level of life, we live very well, but you use lots of planets. So if we all move in that sense, we will need to multiply the number of planets we have, which is something we cannot do right now. So we should all try to move towards the upper left, live very well, and not use too much planet. And this is a fairly new concept. I mean, until now, we have not really moved this way. Um, the idea of keeping the environment, but as you'll see, not only the environment, but the overall quality is a rather new concept in planning. Um, it used to be something considered a little bit extreme. So uh, if we consider a village now, and especially in ancient times, things were quite easy because in a village, um, uh, little Peter could go and play with Mary, who lived next door, then daddy would work in the other side of town, uh, granny would invite them for lunch, and they would go shopping, everything is rather simple and was rather simple. But if we pass to a different level, um, if we become a city, then we need technology, we need networks to help us support uh, those values that were our ancient values, which we have in the meanwhile, of course, improved. I mean, we are not stopping at just eating, sleeping at the essential ones. We, they are more sophisticated, but also the dimensions, the complexity of our cities make things um, uh, more difficult. And therefore, we do need technology and research to help us retrieve those ancient values in an improved way. So we start, as smart cities start from networks. Okay, networks means um, smart grids. I don't know if you know what a smart grid is. A smart grid, I'm not a technician, so I'm passing you concepts that I've learned, but uh, you probably know more about this. The smart grid is, imagine an electric cable that goes from one say to the other. So we can communicate. The energy can be transmitted in one sense and in the other. And this sounds obvious, but it isn't. It's not yet applied in many places, but this means that you can produce your own energy on the roof on your house, and then you sell it to the distributor, which is something that is not being done. Of course, this needs a high level of technology, also some physical implementation, because you need to put the smart grids down, and you need all the cabins, transformation cabins for the electricity. But you also need to have a change in the mentality to be aware that this is essential for a better improvement of the future. For example, a smart grid consents um, uh, electricity uh, to be used for uh, vehicles. Why? Because a smart grid consents easier charging of the vehicles all over the city. It consents the distributors and the electric companies to fix things and be aware of how things are working or not working without any expenses, which can then be used. This money can be used for improving the services they give. And theoretically, this is still not actual, but 
it is tomorrow, I mean, even maybe this afternoon, it's going to happen. Uh, with domotics, there are things you can do at home, like uh, controlling when your starting machine, when your washing machine starts, because the electricity costs less, because um, in that moment, nobody is demanding too much electricity or vice versa to shut down things when uh, it is not necessary to have them open because someone else is using more electricity. In this way, you can also try to turn uh, the resources towards renewable energy sources and uh, so that you uh, pollute less, okay? We do not use, uh, our, for example, the coal uh, central that we have here in Genoa. Uh, with a smart grid, you can lower the use of electricity coming from that kind of source. Networks also mean ICT. ICT enables everything, enables the master that is now taking place in Genoa, and we have people in other parts of Europe listening and participating. Um, but it also concerns, I mean, it helps the smart grids and the transmission of things. So ICT is taken for granted, but it is an essential aspect of the smart city. Um, it means infrastructures that connect things, all sorts of infrastructures which are essential. It means cultural networks. It means social networks, social networks which are something obvious for you young people. For us, there are a new frontier that we have just found that it is essential because communication now happens. And for example, you can create apps and, and I mean, we've seen revolutions partly being triggered by social uh, networks. So the city, in a sense, is like a living body which needs a brain to grow its healthy growth. So this is essential to understand. I mean, the city moves, grows all the time. It's very challenging. And if you don't have a brain that connects everything, it will be chaos, as it often is in our present cities and as it will be in the megalopolis, especially in other countries, in, in China and in India, that are growing. And if there is no control from the beginning with some elements that I will show you, we will have, we will have total chaos. But we will go towards a Blade Runner sort of city and not towards something where people live happily. So the definition that we have come up with of, gen of a smart city, and I again repeat, this is our definition, which of course can be applied to any city. There, are, You will hear other definitions, but more or less the concepts inside are the same. It means a city that improves quality of life. So this is the first important thing that you must be always aware of. Um, a smart city has to make people live better. This is what really uh, has a meaning for politicians, for the people, for people who work in companies, institutions, because this is the ultimate aim of turning the city into some place where you live better. And this will not be forgotten. You will see in the process of the presentation that uh, there are some things that you can do in this sense. Um, then, uh, the smart city is done through economic development. That means that we want companies to work. We want companies to create jobs for you. I mean, you finish the master, you have to find a job. Okay, economic development. This is, needs to be specified because um, some talk has been made about what is called the happy degrowth. That means uh, not using, not creating more jobs because we can live happily with what we have. Okay, the concept of the smart city is not that. I mean, each city has its own location. It decides what it wants to be. But we are working towards an economic development, which must be sustainable. Sustainable from an environmental point of view, something we have not considered before, but now we must. And also sustainable economically and financially, and we will see some of the elements that might turn a city into something smart later. It is based on research and high tech, which enable this kind of uh, action. You probably have heard other speakers the first day and probably also um, uh, this morning speaking about some technology and what an enormous uh, enabler technology working together with the research, of course, and innovation uh, can be uh, a Think about the cold ironing of uh, uh, ships that do not use um, uh, oil and they use other kind of electricity and the communications and knowing when a ship is coming or when it's going and where it is and what exactly it has inside. So being able to plan and all this is done thanks to research and technology. Um, the smart city is guided by the local leadership in a process of planning, planned integra of uh, integrated planning. What does this mean? It means that the local leadership, you know that cities have less and less money. You're aware of this all over the world. I mean, in, in general, like in Madrid, like in Brussels, everywhere. 
there's uh, less money. So cities have more and more a role of um, strategic choice of what the citizens really want. So uh, the guidance of uh, the local government, of the municipality, is something that is rather new in the process because municipalities tended to be something that gave services that were asked and, and, and was limited to doing things more than planning. But with money that is already allocated to predefined um, uh, voices, because there is very little flexibility considering the low level of money we have, uh, the local leadership is essential in triggering a process that will involve all stakeholders. Stakeholders means institutions, it means uh, research, it means companies, big, small, it means associations, it means civil society, it means banks and uh, other sorts of financial institutions. The integrated planning, a very important word, uh, relatively obvious for Anglo-Saxon countries, quite new for Latin countries where we are accustomed to be very creative and do things uh, and then work as we go. But the integrated planning of a city, as we saw before, the city needs to grow, but you need to be aware of everything that is happening in a city in order for it to become smart, to put together all the pieces. So. This is a bit the concept of the, of the smart city that we have developed and we are using and trying to apply together with all the stakeholders I, I told you before about. Um, why do we speak about smart cities and not about smart countries? Uh, well, um, at the beginning, the smart cities, the concept is that, um, as you know, about 70% of the population in Europe lives lives in cities and um, 300,000 people every day move from the countryside to the city, not, not in Europe, of course, but in China, India, in the third world and other countries. So um, it is there that things are happening. It's an interesting dimension for the market deployment of products. We spoke about economic development and means companies need to sell their products and the city has a level which is big enough for most products to be interesting. There is a principle of subsidiarity, the European principle of getting the decisions as near to the um, beneficiary or to the person who is involved with the decision as possible. Cities change, change all the time. It's relatively easy and a change, the, the changes to follow the changes of a city. And it is politically appealing, which means that politicians nowadays, local politicians, usually have a smart city in their, in their program. But this means that then they need to implement it. So it is interesting because the smart city concept is being used more and more all over Europe, all over the world as a concept to convince people uh, to vote for you. And once you're voted for, then you need to do what you have promised. The characteristics of Genoa. Genoa is an excellent lab because Genoa has mountains, which mean a very peculiar mobility. It means uh, floods, for example. We have floods that kill people in Genoa because we have the mountains going right into the sea. Uh, we have a port, okay, this is what we're speaking about. We have a port which means uh, goods, it means people, it means enormous movements of traffic going, coming, and it means an enormous impact on the city, and it is in the city. It means uh, deindustrialization. It's a process that is an ongoing process that has been going on for at least 20, 30 years. Genoa's decreasing population in the last census, for example, we are under 600,000 inhabitants. Um, in the 1970s, we had 850,000. So um, this uh, creates a vocational crisis which needs to be considered. Um, we have a strong brain drain. Many of you will probably end up working elsewhere because uh, there are not enough jobs. We have the sea. The sea has its own characteristics. It's a limit for growth in a sense, but it has its own uh, thermodynamics specialities, uh, specificities, and um, it means traveling, it means uh, pleasure, it means many specific things. We have an old town full of ancient buildings, uh, full of um, as, uh, it's very, very t uh, small and curved and complicated network of uh, streets, which make things different, for example, in controlling safety, okay? So it, it is a um, specific approach. We have a very aged population. There's 244 people over 65 for every 100 people under 15, okay? So uh, each, each kid has two and a half old people to care for already now. All those characteristics turn genuine in a very interesting lab because Genoa is a place where all things, all negative things 
are going on or can happen. And that's the place where you can solve them. So we have an excellent place where we can offer companies uh, a test lab to try to make a smart city. Of course, each city has its own characteristic and the model is replicable and it can be applied in other places. Each city, again, as I said, has to find its own location and we will see later how this process can be made. Um, what, had, what did we do when we started approaching the smart city? We thought we started from energy, okay, the set plan, the, the European Commission through its um, general direct, the directorate uh, on energy, DGN, uh, had uh, written a paper called the set plan, strategic energy technology plan, uh, speaking about the smart cities as the instrument to implement uh, renewable energy sources as, such as uh, um, solar or um, photovoltaic or wind or carbon capture and storage and biomass, etc. And it said it's the cities who are the main characters in this issue. So they need to become smart in order for this change to happen. So we started this process and we realized that a municipality is, however, a bureaucracy. A bureaucracy is, however, limited by laws, by uh, ways of working by people who are relatively old. In general, uh, the average age of um, the municipal worker is 54 years. Okay, I mean, that's really old. It's difficult to change. So we listened to the territory to see what they thought and we asked them to help us. So we created an association, the association, the General Smart City Association. Companies have to pay to be part of the association according to the number of employees they have. They pay a different amount of money and this helps the city work towards a smart city. It helps uh, pay a project manager helping us develop and uh, engineer the process of transformation. It helped us uh, make some communication about the whole process. It helped us travel, some travel expenses to go to a conference or to a meeting. So we have uh, created this instrument which connects together the stakeholders I told you about, so the, again, the, the institutions, all of them, the Port Authority, as well as the region, as well as the municipality, the Chamber of Commerce, and the province. Uh, we have involved companies. Companies mean very big companies, such as uh, ADB, Ericsson, Ansaldo, FinMechanica Group, uh, NL, of course, the distributor, uh, Siemens, uh, and it means small and medium enterprises, which are the backbone of Italy, not only Italy, also Europe. So we connect them together. We have the associations of companies, such as Confindustria, that's the Industrial Union, or the Association of Builders, Acidil, uh, and others. We have research, research meaning the university as a whole. We have the National Institute for Research, CNR. We have the institute that researches for blind people, Istituto Davide Chiossone. We have uh, Cetena, which you probably know is the institute that makes research on sea uh, aspects and uh, all that has to do with ship and, uh, and sea. Um, and we have the civil society. Okay, we have some members, some honorary members who come from the civil society. So what does the association do? What do people in the association do? What do the companies do? They meet together, they talk, they plan, they work together, and they build together the process. Okay, so it is a sort of network. There are many networks. There is uh, an Italian company, Industria, the Union of Industries, or there is a Rotary, or other sorts of networks. But the General Smart City Association uh, puts people, connects people together with the same goal of transforming the city, of working towards the same process. And this is what we're doing. So the, 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 the quantity that is more or less, we have around 80 members who come from institutions and red uh, businesses and blue big businesses, associations uh, in green, uh, small enterprises in yellow. Did someone speak? No? Qualcuno ha chiesto di parlare? Okay, um, research in white and in orange we have the civil society. So this is more or less the composition of the association and um, once a month at least we have new members wanting to, to participate in this process. Um, in order to sort of make things more concrete and to understand each other, to know what a company is doing and to integrate this in the process uh, within a municipality, 
you're all very young, so probably you have not had the opportunity um, of working in a, a municipality or in an institution, which tends to be something that's quite rigid and structured, and uh, there's little space for new things because you have enough as it is with what you're doing every day. So we have created the model of the memorandums of understanding, and with, with some of the members of the association, especially the big companies, but not only, we have signed specific memorandums of understanding on something that they will do for us, on a feasibility project, on um, a study that they will do. So, for example, ABB studies, uh, a bit of code ironing on the port, because uh, the Port Authority is a member of the, of the association. It also studies um, a smart building, but considered from a health point of view. A smart hospital is different from a smart house, of course, and smart in this sense means using this energy, uh, making people live better, uh, having the right heat, the right uh, uh, cold, uh, um, having the right level of sound, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Toshiba is studying uh, uh, solid-state lighting, LEDs, uh, in a museum, the Museum Kyosone, which is one of the best uh, oriental art museums in the world and which is in general. It has already implemented a pilot project changing the lights, and it is also studying uh, the water and uh, the, the so-called rivers. Um, I say this for our foreign uh, uh, partners. We have rivers in Genoa that are actually non-existent. I mean, a glass of water is passing, but they can flood the city and they can kill people. So it is important to monitor what is happening in those strange rivers that are typical of the Apennine Mountains. Um, Siemens studies the green airport. Uh, there are some things that you can do in an airport, not not. Uh, considering fuel of airplanes, but in the rest of the airport there are many things that can happen, like electric mobility within, or the transportation and um, photovoltaic or, or other ways of turning the airport smart. Um, and NL is studying, of course, the smart grid and is going to invest uh, something like at least 5 million uh, euros in Jena to develop the smart grid and the smart meter. NL has developed, um, ha we have 31 smart meters in Italy. I mean, almost every household has a smart meter, which consents uh, the distributor to read exactly the data, and you pay only what you have really used. But also, this is what will enable when we uh, are able to connect a bit better with uh, house appliances, for example, to connect so that um, in, in France, in uh, Lyon, there is a project in which um, some uh, buildings have got together and made a project. So through the smart meters, they buy electricity according to the cost, the hourly cost or daily cost, which of course changes. And so if you get together with the smart meters, you know when you can buy the right kind of electricity, so you save lots of money. Um, it's also studying the uh, wind farm on the dam uh, outside Genoa. You probably know about that. And so an L group is developing this as one, um, uh, the, the bit that the Port Authority made. Ericsson is studying uh, the, how we move through cell phones. So, um, for example, bus number, I don't know, 35 goes every day up and down the hills. But is it really needed? So with um, mobile phones, you can track the number of people and what they are doing. It is very <laughs> unpleasant to know it. It's very big brother sort of thing. And they say it's anonymous. I hope so. But however, it is true that we can use it. And we can know that it's useless to send a bus at 7.15 on top of the hill because nobody is waiting for number 35. Okay, so. We are studying this kind of project, which will, of course, save money because then you'll send the bus to a place where everybody's waiting. Um, the telecom is study, studying a smart school. Smart school uh, means uh, kids using tablets, but also having a more pleasant environment where they can work and be disturbed or not by uh, ICT and not only that. Um, it also studies how to uh, um, uh, how to implement the um, uh, fiber optics without big excavations, but through small ones. So you see, I'm telling you some things that are very very concrete. I mean, a small excavation of eight centimeters instead of the whole road 
those are things that make a city smart. Um, well, IBM is, is the only company which did not confirm its association, uh, its membership in the association the second year, but it has done a great job on the smarter city and smarter planet uh, um, conception of the process of transformation. Um, Celex, uh, and it was called Celex Celtic, now it's Celex uh, Electronic Systems. It's uh, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, European group in um, aeronautics and um, uh, military uh, um, te technology and also in the smart city and it has a part of its company in general and they are studying they have studied already they have monitored the energy consumption in one of the municipal buildings called Matitone so for example just simply turning the bathroom lights off at night it doesn't happen because you have to turn them off okay and I know our, our grandparents maybe not yours but ours always told us turn the light off switch the light off and we didn't pay attention but this if you add it up in all the 24 floors, it means some money. Not only that, but also the air conditioning goes on at night because it's automatic. So that kind of control can be changed with investments that might be, imagine 200,000 euros. That's not much money. The municipality doesn't have it, of course, but it's not much money because the savings come in two, three, four years. They are not uh, very far away in time. Um, it also studies um, how, uh, how things are moving in the mountains, you know, that we have uh, landslides and we have problems created by water, by buildings uh, built many, many ages ago and then roads added or things cut. And so you can have a system, a navigator, a software that controls the whole system uh, using the existing sensors in order to have an idea of what things are happening. And so if you can foresee events, you can use the money much better because you'll use it not to fix things afterwards or to um, hear people who have been hurt, but to avoid that this happens. And so with also with other companies, we have a special memorandums of understanding. And this helps us know what the company is doing it lets the company concentrate on one specific topic, but it also helps us convince our colleagues on what possible new options they have, what they can do that is different, how they can work in a different way and change uh, their approach to their everyday job thus making a better job in the whole. So uh, the, the colleagues who are in charge of uh, monitoring the water level of the rivers will be uh, are very happy in knowing that there's a software that will enable them to do their job better, for example. I'm t I'm, I, and I'm speaking about a very touchy subject in general because, I mean, this has created some problems, uh, some very serious problems. Um, so uh, what is in a sense, the smart city. I have tried to, to explain to you what the smart city, it's a concept, it's technology. Of course, it's technology. But a smart city is also a vision. You need to know where the city is going to. And you need to have the rails, but you also need to have the sleepers. The sleepers are the things you do. So you need to do things in mobility and outdoor life and information, water. In this way, you will have the smart city working but you need both things so there are many cities that have many interesting apps with the smartphones or all the mobility is electrical but if they don't have an overall vision and they don't plan the process of transformation it will not be a smart city because things can stop in a minute whereas if you have married a vision and you have decided that you're going to change the city then it does not really matter how many of those leapers you have done how many things you know that you're working in that process so this and in this general has done a good job when i spoke about university university means of course engineering engineering is essential it is the the the, the, the main character in a sense of the process but it also means other faculties. It means physics, of course. It means chemistry. I mean, think about the paintings uh, with all the nanotechnologies that can uh, use the light, the solar light. There are many innovations, many inter interesting innovations. Economics to help, economics, maths to help find models that will make you understand what happens if you take one course of action or another. It means philosophy because you have to elaborate the vision. It means literature to help you communicate because if you do not convince people to change their way of living, if you don't convince us to use uh, public transport uh, or in other cities bicycle here, it's impossible, I mean in other cities, then you cannot really change the whole city. So it means um, the whole of the research must be involved in this, in this process, not just one technological faculty, because the smart city again is not only technological, technology enables the process, but you need to think differently. 
uh, in the association we have created a technical scientific committee which is led by Paola Gervinho. You had Paola Gervinho as a speaker the other day. We have chosen four topics that we're going to extend this, but at the beginning we needed some order in the things we did, so we, we chose the topics indicated by the set plan of the European Commission, which are buildings, mobility, uh, energy, and we added the port, of course. And we asked all the partners and all the members of the association to send us their projects, what they are doing in those topics. So with this, we have elaborated a matrix, we have an elaborated a, a database in which we have classified the various projects that we have and the characteristics and the technologies and the costs and the, the time of implementation so that we have a very clear database of what companies and the city and the institutions can make towards a smart city. And uh, when we have opportunities, we have projects or things we can do, we know where to uh, get things from. So this is a very uh, important concept because the, starting from the data you have is an essential uh, aspect that in all that involves technology or transformation is necessary and is not part of our culture. It's becoming, but it is essential that we remember that there must be baselines and measurements which really consent you to choose one thing or the other and not just and only because you think it's better. Um, we spoke about integrated, I spoke about integrated planning. Integrated planning means putting things together. A municipality has many instruments, many planning instruments. Um, we have uh, the planning instrument, which is the um, urban plan. Uh, okay, you had Anna Corsi and the urban lab tell you all about the planning. And so you know that we have integrated the concept and it was made with a vision and it was integrated with the concept of the smart city. We have the Sustainable Energy Action Plan, which won last year's uh, Kyoto Protocol um, uh, Club Prize. Uh, it is uh, really well designed. It was um, added Liguria, the regional energy agency of Liguria, uh, and uh, the city of Genoa, and the municipality, uh, Ilaria del Ponte, spoke to you this morning, probably about the same. And this was strongly integrated with the urban plan book and with what the municipality does. So all the mayor's uh, plans, which are then integrated with the work that uh, we do every day in the municipality, so our goals on which we are valued and judged, have integrated the idea. So we have asked everyone to change their point of view and to think of what SMART means. And for example, the lawyers in the municipality have said, well, I could, instead of taking five copies of every um, paper I have to the um, um, to court, I will ask them if I can take only two. Okay, this is a small thing, but it means that people have started thinking differently, which is something that would not have happened without the smart city process. You have the urban uh, mobility plan, and you have other ways of planning, but you must put them together, you must connect them. You cannot have an urban plan be developed if you're not aware of the energy aspects, if you are not aware of what electricity means, what energy means, if whether you can have solar panels or not, how much they cost and where you can apply them because, you know, we're speaking about ancient cities. You cannot put solar panels in ancient buildings. You just won't. I mean, it's not like in the north of Europe where you build new houses. So all this must be put together. You remember we said that the city is a living body that needs a brain. So this is also part of the brain integrating all the planning instruments you have. Um, Creating awareness is essential. You have to create awareness with kids in the first place. Kids are easy because they immediately understand the concept. They understand that we have ruined their planet. Now we must try to we must try to work on giving it back to them and to you a bit cleaner, a bit better, a bit healthier. So uh, we have to create awareness in order to have behavioral changes. So we we'll try to communicate and to make some lobbying because there are some things that can be made only by pressure, by pressure of cities connected together. Um, think about um, pollution. Pollution uh, creates health problems. Some health problems can be directly connected to the pollution, some sorts of some forms of cancer. So if we could have the money that is going to be spent tomorrow in the next 10 years for healing those cancers and taking care of, taking care of the ill people, we could use this money to 
avoid the pollution. So the collateral advantage would be saving people's lives, so we would have a better place. But all this can be done only if you change the laws, if you change the mentality, and this needs lobbying and connecting and working together. So uh, part of the process is creating, well, we have a site that you can consult. How do you pay for this? I told you, I mean, uh, theoretically, a smart city pays for itself, or one day will pay for itself with the savings it has, but it is not automatically automatically done. And uh, banks still tend to tell you, okay, uh, I'll give you Euribor plus 2%, plus 5%, or, and that is not the idea. The idea is that you have to work together because there are different financial instruments that can be approached. There is innovative funding, there is um, public-private partnerships, there is a uh, European Energy Efficiency Fund, uh, uh, structural fund, uh, there is the, the Ministry of Research in Italy, MUR, just made um, a call and uh, the results were given out on Monday uh, for projects on the smart cities and communities to make people work together and companies work together with research on this, and Genoa won several uh, of those. Um, the Elena is a very interesting fund. Uh, the Elena is uh, money that the European Union gives to the um, European Investment Bank, okay, EIB. Uh, it gets the money and you apply for it, you go and ask, you say, I have this project in which I can improve the energy efficiency of my buildings or I can buy electric vehicles or uh, energy efficient build, uh, vehicles or can, I can uh, change the uh, public lighting, turn it towards uh, uh, solid state lighting. Uh, please give me the money to help me um, create the business case because a municipality has one, two, three, fifteen people, whatever, working on um, the general services who buy things, buy products, they buy the paper or the microphones, or they make the, the calls for offer, but uh, they do not have time and uh, the skills to create something more innovative. So the European Lack of Advancements gives the municipality the money. The money means two million euro, okay? I mean, it doesn't mean little money. With the two million euros, you build this, uh, the, the, the feasibility projects, the studies of exactly how much energy you're spending, how much you will save, how you will do it, the technical studies, and then you have um, the uh, uh, call for offers for ESCOs. You know what an ESCO is? Well, an ESCO is an energy service company. It's the companies that will substitute, for example, your boiler, uh, and with the savings, they will pay for the investment they had made. So for 10 years, they'll keep the savings, and then you get a, a boiler that is very efficient, and you save lots of money. I'm simplifying the model, but more or less, this is the idea. Okay, so um, the ESCOs will win this. Then the European Investment Banks is willing to uh, make a loan to those, those ESCOs. They have a loan which can be 90 million euros. With this loan, the ESCOs make the investments, the energy efficiency investments, and repay with the savings. The municipality keeps on paying what it was paying, or a little bit less, for 10 years, 15, 20, whatever the business case has shown. And then the result is that without having spent money of your own, it's always public money, I mean, it's uh, European money, but without having spent money that the municipality did not have, you have managed to make the whole city efficient. So we are going to apply for an Elena, we're working very hard on that, other cities have already done it, but it's one of the instruments that can give you an idea of what is happening. Let me check the time. Um, so in a sense, what we are doing with the smart city is juxtaposing the grids of needs and I will tell you something more about this later because you, know, you need to listen to the people of strategies, political strategies that have been chosen by the politicians who have been chosen by the citizens, the technologies, the available technologies, innovations, funding, which kind of funding you have, the rules. So you need to juxtapose all those grids and try to find the right whole, the right place for each kind of project, be it mobility, building, government, energy, uh, solid state lighting, or other projects. So it is a very complicated work that connects to what I told you about integrated planning. A smart city really needs to put all things together in order to make the whole uh, something better, okay? So it is not something that happens automatic, and if someone says, 
is this a smart city or not? You cannot answer. I mean, a smart city is not uh, defined. There are many researches that say uh, Bologna is smarter than uh, Milan, which is smarter than Copenhagen, which is smarter than Colorado. It doesn't matter. I mean, it depends, of course, on the parameters that they're using on the indexes. But the idea is that you have to marry the process. You have to start the process of transforming your city, being aware of what you're doing. Um, the needs. I spoke about the needs. Now, uh, when we start speaking about smart city, we start speaking about technology. And so engineers have great ideas. They have incredible things that create energy or save. Uh, and uh, also um, uh, people from the chemistry business. Many, many people will come in with many good technological projects. But then you go and listen to the people. And the people tell you, for example, um, a machine that uh, you put at home and the grandpa just puts his finger inside the machine and everyone knows in the hospital uh, his blood pressure and whether he's okay or not and glucose and everything. Look at this machine does not measure whether he's happy in a sense. And maybe he needs to walk 10 minutes every day because that will be more important for his health and for his living on than having the exact level of blood pressure measured every day. So we met with some of the associations we know in this very humble process that we have done towards a smart city. And we spoke with the Comunità di Sant'Egidio. It's a very big charity in Italy. And uh, we spoke to them about smart city. And they said, for example, they, gave, they told us this. They said, we don't want those machines. I mean, not everywhere. But we also need people to move. So maybe it would be better to have those machines at the bakers, so that the person has to walk to the bakers to be measured. But this kind of idea uh, taught us that you really, lit, uh, you really need to listen to the needs, okay? Um, and the needs are not always known by university or by the companies or by the municipalities. Right now, we, we voted uh, two weeks ago, and the whatever, whoever won, it doesn't matter, I'm not discussing that, but what really emerges is that people want to be listened to, okay? Um, all the, the political phenomena in Italy, it's very strong, the fact that people say, I want to participate directly. And so um, uh, no, I, I don't intend to apply the models of uh, democracy. I mean, it's, I'm not a, a sociologist or a politician, but uh, certainly we need to be aware that maybe people want Wi-Fi all over. For you young people, it's obvious people go all over the world, they have Wi-Fi, then they come to Italy and they cannot connect because the Wi-Fi, you need to get the name, the phone number, it must be an Italian phone number, it's, it's not an Italian phone number, that you cannot have the password and everything is complicated. Or maybe you want to play soccer near home, maybe you, have, you want to develop soccer fields near home because that is what makes your happiness. And what does this have to do with a smart city? It has. I mean, in the planning of the city, you have to take into account what people really want, whether they want silence. Is silence a value? Maybe it is. We are forgetting this. We never consider it, but maybe we want it. So, it is important to be able to listen to the needs. That's why we have created um, this connection. And we are uh, working in the association to have smart people uh, telling us. So we are creating uh, groups, working groups, in which we listen to the various categories proposed by them, whether it be the disabled or old people or, or schools or whoever that come with the needs. And this is going to be connected with the technology, with the research, with the institutions, always in order to make a better process, to make a better city. Um, we have also tried to promote the idea that uh, Genoa does not become smart if Torino is stupid, okay? Uh, because the smart city process needs to involve everyone. And it is not something that only one city wins and the others lose. So we are promoting the Smart Italy. We're promoting the idea of transferring our experience and our good practices to other cities and gain from theirs. So we have signed a memorandum of understanding, a political one, which of course is the first level. Without that, you cannot work. We have signed a political um, understanding with Torino and Milano, uh, which are the two cities that are near Genoa in this famous industrial or previously industrial triangle, uh, in order to move together, both at a lobbying level, in transferring information. We're working with the Politecnico di Torino and the university connecting together, and the municipalities and the offices in order to learn from each other. 
also we take this at a governmental level so we've been working with the previous government with, with the present government um, with the ministry of research transferring our experience and trying to help build the, the, the laws they are making on the smart city process in a different way um, there are other networks, for example, there's the City Protocol. City Protocol Society is a very interesting project which is being promoted by Barcelona. And uh, many cities in the world are, are, are participating in this uh, process. Uh, well, Genoa is one, but there's Milan, Turin, uh, Paris, London, San Francisco, New York, uh, uh, Seoul, uh, uh, Yokohama, uh, Hamburg. So um, together we are trying to apply the same concept of the smart city of extending uh, the connections, the best practices, using all the stakeholders and putting them together, trying to turn the city into something better so you can also find this uh, this way of working of the city protocol uh, which considers the cities as i told you before the process and it uses the same kind of organization in a very um, uh, similar way to what happened with the internet when internet was created and the rules of internet were made by the internet protocol society through uh, a rough agreement a rough consensus uh, and this is the same model applied to cities of course it's going to be less strict uh, and less um, uh, mandatory because uh, in the cities you cannot force uh, an African city to do what you're doing in Europe, but you can show the best practices and involve companies, involve research, involve the institutions in this process, and of course the people. And this is a very interesting project, generalized in the interim steering committee uh, of the City Protocol Society. Um, which starts from a, a very interesting planning uh, of the city, of the various aspects, the water, the waste, uh, the electricity, uh, so it, 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 it turns it. Um, I will, uh, if, are there any questions until now? Do you have any questions? Okay, then um, I'm going to proceed uh, telling you something about concrete things, because I told you about the theory of a smart city. Now, a smart city, as we saw, has the rails, and then it has the sleepers that are things that need to be done, okay? So um, I will speak about some of the European projects we have. European projects um, uh, are um, a very specific uh, model. They have a specific model, a way of working together which uh, aims to a uh, European integration, but it does so through very concrete um, and detailed uh, projects put together by normally at least three different countries, and uh, this involves all sort of players, so companies and uh, research and uh, institutions uh, working together uh, in order to fulfill whatever the call offered. Um, Genoa has uh, has been lucky or has been good or I don't know, but we have won the three smart cities and communities call in 2011. We are the only city in Europe to have won the three calls, which uh, concern the integrated planning, uh, heating and cooling, and um, energy efficiency. Uh, we have we are working together within the university and uh, all those uh, projects, and they will bring the city of Genoa around uh, uh, 6 million euros because um, we co-participated uh, in the 7th research program so you need to participate with 50% and you will get 50% but this concerns the research so we can put personnel into it and this means that we are creating jobs or we are at least maintaining the jobs that exist because the companies working will have people working there so this in a, in a moment of crisis like we have this is very important. So. I will shortly tell you something about those projects so that you understand exactly how a smart city then becomes something concrete. Um, Transform is the project that we consider the most important one because it is the one that tries to find the model of the smart city at a European level. It doesn't have much money. In all, we, we get uh, 600,000 euros for the city of Genoa, which is divided among university, city, and uh, regional energy, a uh, regional uh, energy agency, and uh, the region Liguria in Brussels, um, and uh, uh, NL, the distribution company who is a partner. But it is very important because this is the project that will 
find a model and the European Union will probably use this model of transformation to uh, decide how it will spend the money and its future investments in the uh, 1420 uh, budgeting. Uh, of course, we, we, will, we won't be finished. We, we still have two years to go. The projects have just started. But Transform puts together uh, many cities. We have six cities, which are Amsterdam, which is coordinating the project, Hamburg, Copenhagen, Vienna, Lyon, and Genoa. And we have uh, players that are institutional, like the cities. We have uh, research. Uh, we have, in, 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 in Genoa, we have also the university. Uh, we have uh, the Denmark University and Danish University, uh, Hamburg Institute of Research, Hespool, which is the uh, sort of regional agency for energy and beyond. Uh, and we have companies. We have Siemens. Uh, we have uh, NL. We have the ERDF. Uh, um, and other companies all over the world we have 19 partners working together. How do we work together? Um, I know if you're aware, um, uh, European projects are usually divided into working packages because it is a very <laughs> integrated planning way of proceeding. Uh, so you have working packages, you divide the activities into work packages that normally have a leader and you show how they're going to connect and what the timing is and which deliverables you are going to give and when. So you need to plan this when you present the project. So um, the first work package studies the um, state of the art, finding out the KPIs, the key performance indicators. So we said before, data are essential. So we are starting with the data. And which data, data are important for each city? Because of course, Vienna will not care about the data concerning the port. Uh, but for us, it's important. Maybe they will care about the uh, immigration uh, from Eastern Europe, which is not so important for us, etc. But in the overall planning, um, just think uh, wind farms are easy to make in the north of Europe, okay, in Copenhagen, out of Copenhagen, if you have ever flown inside, you know, there are enormous wind farms. We cannot have this here. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the sea goes down immediately, so it is almost impossible um, unless engineers come out with something really creative and innovative for the time being. It is very difficult to have a wind farm uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, in this part of the Mediterranean. Uh, so each city had its own characteristics, its own vision, uh, but there are certainly common key performance indicators that are the same for everyone. And so in the first work package, which is led by Copenhagen, we are finding those. Of course, the university is working um, very, very much on this and starting from the uh, Sustainable Energy Action Plan, which you, you have heard about before. So uh, using the indicators that have been studied. And work package two works on the transformation agenda. Uh, but um, before getting to work package two, we also have work package three that studies the, uh, the, the um, sorry, work package four in fact, is the smart urban labs. In each city, we have found a sort of pilot project not funded by the European Union. So it is only the study of how one district is being transformed into a smart city or is planned as a smart district. In our case, we have taken the CatMed uh, project in Valtry, maybe uh, they have spoken about, about it yesterday when they presented uh, the urban plan, which is a smart district. So we are using this district and the indicators that were already elaborated in the process in order to think how a smart district should be in a Mediterranean country, which is totally different from the north. I mean, we have buildings that exist and we cannot bring them down very often, most of the time, and we cannot move the railways all of a sudden because we decided it's not good there because you cannot demolish the ancient villas that are behind uh, the railway, etc., uh, etc. Et so the Smart Urban Labs, together with the KPIs and the state of the art, go to work package to, to develop this transformation agenda. So how are we going to change the city and what do we want? What are the essential elements? Then we will make a tool, a software tool, a sort of a command center uh, using the existing ones who are trying, because the, the, the project does not have much money, but we are wanting to work with things that already exist. And then we will use all the experience gathered and learned uh, to disseminate the project. And this is led by the City of Genoa, the work package five concerning the replication and dissemination. We will create master classes with what we have called buddy cities, that is cities with which we have good connection, good real connections, direct connections, and invite them to learn from the process and try to apply the same model. So you see the smart city is really fascinating because it's something that is 
quite obvious. I mean, you say, well, of course it should be like that. I mean, a city should be planned like that, but it isn't, it isn't. It's something totally new, both for us, but also for other countries. And it is a, a way of changing the mentality of the way in which you manage the city. It's important for politicians and for people working inside. And for the first time, a very strong connection and very strong and practical connection with the other stakeholders is taking place. Because it did happen that the university spoke with the municipality or that the municipality spoke with the Board of Poetry or with a company, but it was not systematic and it was not aimed at a common goal. So this is the essential aspect of the smart city. Um, this is the way in which the, the process will work. So we will study the status, the SWOT analysis, and find the methodology. And uh, the timing, it will take three years to complete the project. We have already started in January. We have the kickoff meeting. And we are working together with all the other partners with meetings that happen quite often. They are funded, of course, by the project in order to put together all the, the pieces of the work package. The pilot projects concern each one of the cities. Some cities have, for example, Amsterdam has a district where the um, IX stadium is, so boys probably know about it. Uh, and uh, they had uh, uh, some industries and commercial uh, venues and uh, the stadium and uh, businesses, but it's being a bit abandoned. So they are turning it into the smart district, adding wind farms within the, the buildings and uh, connecting it with smart grids. Uh, Vienna is planning, uh, Vienna is, is going to have an enormous raise in population. It's planning like in the next, I don't know, 10 years, 100,000 people increase. It's really growing very fast. So they are planning new districts and they are planning them smart from the beginning. Uh, Lyon is going to improve the Parc de uh, uh, City District. They already are investing, but they are making a new, the new important station, the train station for Lyon, and they are turning the whole thing into a smart project. We are using the Green Apple uh, system. Um, uh, Copenhagen has a part of the port that has uh, is not being used as port anymore, and it is turning it. It has conducted some very thorough studies of the population's needs. Um, for example, it has an interesting uh, concept of the uh, five-minute city, things you can do within five minutes. No? Okay, so that's that's one of the concepts that you can insert in the planning of the city if you make it smart. Um, uh, so, well, this is more or less the overall view of this project. Those are the deliverables we have in the various months, month one, two, five, whatever. You have to give the project manual, the internet and public portal, the coherent description of the state of the art. So you see it's very um, well defined. And if you do not respect the timings, you have to explain very clearly why not. Otherwise, you won't get the money or you will have to give it back. So this way of working of the European projects is very useful, um, uh, especially in the context of the smart city it is, however. Then we have the project R2 Cities. R2 Cities concerns energy efficiency. Uh, we have chosen, um, we, we work together with uh, Spain and Turkey, okay, Istanbul and um, uh, Valladolid. Uh, then there are companies and research institutes from all over Europe. And um, we are studying the diagnosis of how to make a social uh, housing building more efficient. We have an enormous amount of buildings from the 60s and the 70s where energy was not an issue, okay? Energy started being an issue in 73, but then we forgot about it. We thought after the Gulf War, everything was okay again. So buildings built at the time only wanted to save money in the building. There was no planning on what would happen in the future. Also in social housing, there is a, a peculiar aspect, which is that the savings go to the people who live there, who very often don't even pay the bills. So it is very difficult to have the model of the ESCO model in which you save the money by changing the boiler, but then the savings go to someone who's not willing to participate in the investment. So it is interesting to study, to have the money to study how to apply innovation and technology and also a um, replicable business model in social housing. So we study the conservation technology, a, ve a very thorough and technical uh, approach to the research of how it works. Uh, then we have the three pilot projects. Um, and Genoa is using the case of uh, Bigato. Bigato is a, 
uh, in one of the two valleys going up from the city of Genoa uh, towards the north, the uh, Valpolcevera, and it is uh, an enormous, we call it the dam, the dam, okay, La Diga, uh, because it really stops the valley. It is a wonderful place. I mean, the, the apartments have an incredible view. They are in the green, but they are really, <laughs> they, they, they freeze because it's really cold and the heating is really bad, and uh, it was built when it really didn't matter. So we're working, and, and as our partners in the project, we also have ADB, which has all the technology for studying, for example, shutters that will open and close according to the climate that is inside. We have a bank. We have Unicredit, which has a, a joint venture with uh, the World Wildlife Fund, and it has created a company called Officine Verdi, and they are studying the um, economic feasibility of this kind of uh, project, um, both for the municipalities and for the companies. Um, uh, then, of course, well, again, here we have a planning. This one lasts longer. Uh, it's four years, and we have a number of deliverables. We have not started yet. We still have not had the kick-up meeting, but we have been working on the project for a long time. Then we have the Celsius. Celsius uses, uh, again, we, we have um, other pilot projects going on in London, in uh, Rotterdam, in Köln, in Göteborg. Uh, which has been moved, but it's still in Sweden, and though here I put it somewhere else. Uh, Genoa uh, and we each have a pilot project uh, for district heating and cooling. Uh, so again, we have the system of the work packages. District heating and cooling means that you produce the heating in one place and you take it elsewhere. In Genoa, the uh, pilot project um, is um, specifically connected uh, on um, uh, a new way, a new technology that will use um, the um, uh, change of pressure from how the gas arrives through the gas duct to how it needs to be transferred in city gas. And the energy was absolutely wasted, so they are putting a sort of, a sort of turbine uh, to uh, a sort of propeller. Uh, to use this energy and create heat uh, in the in a very small district, a micro district uh, in the other valley, Val Bisagno, uh, where the gas company um, has its offices and its plants. Uh, if the model is uh, interesting and can work both from a technical and an economical point of view, it can be it can be replicated in other places in the city where this takes place take, takes place and probably extended to other parts. Uh, surrounding the plant where it's going to be implemented. Um, we have other projects. Okay, I, I went a bit into detail with those three projects, which are the main ones uh, uh, in the smart cities and communities. But you don't need to have the name smart for a project to be smart. It's smart if you're thinking and planning in the whole framework that I told you about. So, for example, we have the Illuminate project, which concerns solid-state lighting. You probably know that uh, through solid state lighting and um, technologies, uh, software technologies, you can uh, get something like 70% saving in the expenses you have for lighting. Uh, it depends on where you start from. Uh, so um, we this this project uh, studies with companies like Philips and Nell and uh, Arup uh, how what can be done to change the lighting in venues that are uh, 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 high quality. So we have um, the um, we have the aquarium in Genoa, we have the external part of the ancient port, the waterfront, we have uh, the Maritime Museum in Crete and uh, the Maritime Museum in Lithuania, uh, we have the Rotterdam Zoo, um, the experimentarium in Copenhagen, which is uh, the like the museum for kids uh, experimentarium is on science and, and uh, uh, technology. And we have the Belfast uh, City Hall, which is where the peace agreement was signed in Belfast, and which will be um, inaugurated in a couple of months. And all these uh, have the lighting changed to solid state lighting, which has to respect not only the savings, but also the quality of life it can give. And it can give different lumen, different colors, different things that you can change and move. For example, uh, the very interesting uh, project in the uh, Belfast um, the City Hall, uh, which is being used also as a venue where they have concerts and uh, public events. It is considered a very, very important historical and uh, event building. They can change the color uh, according to the event taking on, a bit like, this, like the Empire State Building in New York, which changes according to the 4th of July or uh, uh, no, Gay Pride or whatever is happening that day. 
Um, and of course, we, we hope we will be able to replicate this once we study, we, it's been going on for a year and a half, and once we find the results of the project, we think that we will be able to transfer this to other parts of the city and other cities. This is always required in a European project. Then we have Berry School, which studies energy efficiency in, in, a, in one school in general, um, and it is not only the software for controlling the energy efficiency, but also um, it uh, has, it implies um, uh, educating the people who use the systems, okay? Because uh, um, uh, one of the, for example, to give you an idea, in the I2 cities, the one with the housing, with the social housing building, one of the plans that the university originally proposed was making um, a sort of feature, a hole on top and at the bottom of each uh, um, apartment inside, because th that would consent the air to pass and create a wall that would create a sort of uh, refurbishing, okay? But we said, wait a minute, the people who live there will immediately put scotch tape and cover the holes. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's certain that it will happen. So you, you have to be aware that you need to know who's living there and what kind of um, action you're taking. Um, ICD is a very challenging um, project because it concerns not only the open data, open data in Italy are almost a bad word. I mean, we, we, we don't even speak about open data. We, we keep them to ourselves, and I don't know what we'll do with them, but more and more the European Union and national laws are forcing us to open our data, uh, which is the opposite of what London is doing. For example, London opens everything. But this project, I City, in which the Greater London Authority and Barcelona and Bologna are partners, opens the platforms, which means that you can get access to real-time data. And we have, we are going to open up the platforms for meteorology, which means also the control of uh, all the uh, floods and things like that, the instruments we have right now. Uh, it means the Wi-Fi. We are opening also the uh, mobility the controls. And we are going to offer those open platform platforms for uh, people to create apps. So we expect to have about 300 apps proposed by students, companies, university at the end using those open platforms, which might mean tomorrow that you can even integrate even more. You can even uh, enter into using the sensors. Imagine, for example, a camera that is pointed for traffic on a street. Maybe someone could create an app that uses, I don't know, one minute per hour. You can send this app to use it to, to see something else or uh, and create something that I know where young people need and it will show some app. I don't, I don't know what the interest will be. This is the people who will create them. But it is a very challenging uh, project. Harmonize um, considers the uh, resilience, that is the flexibility of planning the safety and security in a city. And we have chosen uh, the part of the city uh, that we have chosen is uh, the, the zone of Marassi, where we have, this, we have a stadium, we have the prison, which is inside the city. We have um, the highway getting there. Uh, we have um, commercial venues. Uh, that we have a river that can flood. And so we are trying to put together all the possible sensors and players that um, somehow act in that zone and creating a software that will help us control unforeseen events events that you cannot plan and therefore uh, somehow prevent, but things that cannot be foreseen, but you can, however, react rapidly uh, if you have integrated the whole system with what police do, what the um, uh, firemen can do, what people can do, what you can do with SMS, et cetera, with texts, et cetera. Peripheria um, concerns uh, using the technology of the living labs. Living labs, again, means connecting the people, so getting to know what people want, the, what product they want. You, you use people as guinea pigs of the products they are going to buy, but they are the ones who design them, so they, people in the living lab tell you, okay, the product you're building, I want it more like this or more like that, and so you adapt it to those who are going to use it. It's a new a methodology that is being used very much in, in Europe and all over the world. And so we are studying tourist services in, in uh, some parts of the city. Elimed studies energy efficiency in, in parts of the city which have been damaged by the flood in the Piazza Adriatico zone. Um, those are some of the projects we are making, just to give you an idea, uh, of very concrete things that are taking place. Uh, but 
I would also like to um, remind you that the idea of the vision means that you have to think of where you want to go and what you want the city to be. So what we did with the General Smart City Association was um, do um, a, a full day of brainstorming and working together with all players involved in the association and trying to find out what Genova Smart City, what Genova is a Smart City would be for us. Most of the things that emerge can be applied to other cities, but it was important to understand, just like the urban plan had a decalogue of the 10, 10 points you probably were told about, we used the same concept, uh, but this time we did it together with the people to elaborate which were the 10 aspects that we do want in our smart city of the future and possibly of the present. So Genoa a smart city is Mediterranean, beautiful and full of light. It is a Mediterranean city. It has a different sea. We saw that when farms are different here. It is beautiful. It has ancient buildings which cannot be touched and must be respected and somehow are very often smart themselves. You only need to respect what they wear and change the technologies to adapt them to them. It has light and we have no solar panels. Why is that? I mean, we should use the light somehow, so we, we, we should take advantage of the wealth we have. We need an integrated planning and management, and this is essential, and the, through the association and through the smart city process we are doing it, but it, it's an ongoing process that will never stop. It starts but never ends. You need energetic awareness because people not, need to know what uh, going to the gym on the other side of town instead of the one under your place what, what it means. I mean, it means you're using the energy, okay, and, and simple, and of course, in bigger things like public transport. Um, simplify, okay, simplify. I don't want to have, I, uh, I, you are young, but I'm older. I have a piece of paper with the hundred different passwords I have for the different sites, which I don't remember because I won't remember them. So, I mean, my, my life needs to be made simpler. I cannot be um, forced to have more memory in order to remember the things that were supposed to simplify the way in which I use my memory. So this is something that we must remember. Um, last summer, the municipality uh, made a, a big communication campaign saying that now you can get your own certificates directly online. Okay, so you need a birth certificate, you need a... So I had an emergency, one of my kids was going abroad, I needed the certificate, okay, great. I mean, I work in a municipality, so I went online and I did everything, and after my 15 minutes of fighting with what the data they were requiring, okay, okay, your application has been successful, now you need to go to an office to get the paper, because they have to see you in the face. I said, no, wait a minute, <laughs> this is online, I mean, this is, it's not a true simplification, okay, but my colleagues, when I asked them, they said, well, yes, because there is a law that says that, you know, in certain cases, they said, but I don't care, I could buy a nuclear bomb on the internet if I want to, I mean, with a credit card, so you, you have to find a way out of this, you need to, to understand the simplification really means that. Um, information must be easy and for everyone, okay, uh, grandma must be able, uh, with her clumsy fingers to be able to touch or find or whatever it is. I mean, the information must be real. If I'm blind, I must be able to know that the bus is coming or not coming. There must be an acoustic information or whatever. I mean, it's enough to me to, to propose, but if you really keep in mind that the information must be easy and really for all, uh, you, you change the way in which you study things, in which you apply, in which you implement, in which you buy things. Projects need to be challenging. They need to be new and excellent, and they also need to be transferable because this means that the companies will sell their products, okay, and we are happy if the companies sell their products because it means that they create business, that they create jobs for you and that you don't need to go live elsewhere and you can stay in this beautiful city. Uh, the port, the port is part of the city, it's the bigger, the biggest job uh, giver in the city, the biggest employer. And you need to remember, and not as we did until a few years ago, almost even now, the port is there, Jenner is there, but we are together. I mean, you must remember that. And if you don't have a port, whatever you have around, uh, you need to remember the context in which you're moving when you plan a smart city. You have to move and be free to move, but only when you choose. So not because you're forced to move 
in order to get things that you could get at home. So you have to have good transportation, electric mobility, or other um, uh, simple, simpler ways. For example, you have an excellent way of connecting, vertical connection, but it needs to be um, further enhanced and, and implemented. But it has to be when I decide to move, and not because I'm forced to. So it is important to keep this in mind, not to, to plan the city in a way that it will give you the freedom. And people, we want them to stay here, to study here, to work here, and so we need to give them opportunities to do so. So this must be kept in mind when you plan the city. We respect the age. We have so many age people that is essential, but also the handicap. The handicap. This has been luckily a tradition in in Italy and in Genoa. We have a very strong um, uh, way of working for the integration of handicap. But you must remember that handicap exists, and so. Uh, for example, now they, they just remade Via Garibaldi, the main uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, old uh, street in the city. And the problem is that um, we have to put back the stones, the ancient stones that have been there forever. But this does not allow people uh, with the wheelchairs to move uh, very easily. And so you have to try and connect the uh, superintendenza, that's uh, the office in charge of checking that uh, uh, ancient uh, buildings are well kept, but also the handicap that needs to move. So uh, respecting also means this means connecting them together. Uh, and then as a last thing, I will say that for me, Smart City is a woman because women are capable of multitasking, whereas men concentrate on only one goal, and that doesn't make the city smart. Thank you. If you have questions or comments, uh, no answer. Ah. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, R2 cities project, so uh, concerning energy efficiency. And um, well, the reality of the success of the so-called passive house, uh, typically in Germany, but also in other uh, North European countries, it is a matter of fact. So it's, it's clear that um, households' uh, energy demand can be cut down up to 90%. And uh, which are the main obstacles of uh, adopting such models here in Genoa uh, is just a matter of uh, having uh, <laughs> old buildings that cannot be touched or is also uh, there are some legal constraints for instance. That's a very good question. Um, I, I'm not a technical expert so I, I will give you the information that I have on this. So. In the first place, a passive house, the passive the dreams are built from scratch. And that makes a difference, okay? Building a new house and building it passive is easier than changing a house you have. Um, in the second place, uh, we have two, let's say, two, two rough kinds of buildings. The ancient buildings, the really ancient ones, like the ones in Via Garibaldi, where you cannot touch things. I mean, it's really difficult to touch things, but which very often are smart from an energy point of view because they have very wide walls, very thick walls. The slate that is used on roofs has mm, peculiar characteristics, thermal characteristics that make it uh, good for keeping the heat or the warmth in winter and keeping off the heat in summer. Uh, so with the ancient buildings, it is difficult because you cannot make holes to have internet everywhere in a stucco um, uh, complex, um, but um, the maybe most difficult ones are the social housing of the 60s, 70s, early 80s. Um, what are the difficulties there? So the first difficulty concerns the financial aspect. As I told you, the, uh, the advantages of turning your house, for example, if you in your own home change all the windows and put a uh, uh, the ones with four layers of the glass and efficiency, okay, you have the savings, you paid for the investment, the savings are yours. In the social housing, the municipality will pay for the investment and the savings are for the people living inside. So it, it is a very difficult business model for the municipality to make because those savings go to someone else and the law does not consent, I mean, it would be stealing taking their savings away. <laughs> so a, a new legal model must be found. Also, there are some technical aspects. 
one which is banal but enormous, for example, scaffoldings. Okay, the, 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 when you need to, to have, a, you have a, a skyscraper and you need to do some work there, scaffoldings in Italy are very expensive, very, very expensive. For example, in our two cities, they will cost something like 500,000 euros, okay, putting them into place. It's 10 stories, and so you need to, and uh, the security measures are such, I'm not saying they are right or wrong, I mean, they are there, but they make things very difficult. Then the kind of building very often uh, makes um, new uh, um, actions that will not make make them passive. This is impossible or, or active, not even uh, uh, not possible. That that will change the energy e efficiency. Difficult. For example, in our two cities in the Gato building, there are some metal panels in front. You probably saw pictures. There are red panels or white panels. Um, in front of the building. So um, we had planned with the university, okay, we'll take the filling outside so that we will create a sort of thermal wall that makes the air circulate. When we went up there, we discovered that they are fused together. You cannot take them off. So the difficulties are very practical. Of, um, it would be much cheaper to bring them down and pull them down and build them again. Okay, that would make them faster and it would probably be cheaper, but you cannot do that. Okay, it is impossible from a legal point of view, from a political point of view, from a, uh, a very concrete, where do you put the people who live there when they are not there? No? So um, the obstacles that we have um, for the energy efficiency of our buildings are multiple. And they must really, that's why those pilot projects are important because they start touching the sensible, um, the sensitive points and try to understand where it is that you need to intervene. And if possible, integrating with other cities, making some lob lobbying at a national level in order to have some of the assets, for example, the, the financial institutions, which are quite absent from the smart city process. I mean, you know, they, they, they stand back there and, and wait. But um, they could probably help build a model that maybe would make them earn a bit less than they usually do, but help uh, get the savings for the one who makes the investment. So it is all to be discovered. Could uh, the ESCOs uh, play a significant role in future, uh, or it's just a matter of public investment? No, the ESCOs could, but as I told you, the, the model, it, it, it's very banal, it's simple. I mean, the savings go to the people living in there who often don't even pay the bills, okay? So, I mean, they, they don't care whether they save or not, because often they don't pay. You know that now you cannot cut electricity, you need to leave. Uh, even if they, you don't pay the bills, you get 30%. So some people are even living on that. So it is a very difficult model because you would need to uh, change the law saying that if you are the owner of the building and you make an ESCO project and you make the investment and you uh, make the, the building more efficient, the people inside will keep on paying what they are, but the savings go to you. I mean, the, the, the lower part goes to you and to help you keep the investment. And right now, it is not feasible. So you really n need to go on a trial and error uh, basis. There are many innovative projects, but again, on new buildings, it's much easier than on existing ones. Thank you. No, ma io sono io barbi, perché sono stata
Grazie, in genere mi muovo perché almeno così, allora non sai mai se sono da giù, non sai mai se sono da giù. No, ma non
No, no, lo compro anche io. E poi se vuole invece girare o lo, o lo faccio io o No, 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 lo faccio io. Buon pomeriggio. I don't speak English because my English is not good. And after uh, the, 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 this, uh, the, the time, I think uh, it's better I, I speak in Italian. And Mrs. Mrs. Piaggio, Mrs. Piaggio, translate. Okay. Allora, quello che noi eh, abbiamo eh, implementato a Savona nel, come, come Port Authority sono una serie di interventi atti prima di tutto a sperimentare determinate tecnologie che sono legate a quello che un giorno sarà il concetto di Smart Grid che è una delle possibili, anzi forse è l'unica possibilità che abbiamo di poter far quadrare 
il, eh, il sistema di distribuzione dell'energia elettrica e di altre diciamo, eh, possibilità di, eh, di supply, cioè di, di <coughs> approvvigionamento, che riguardano anche l'acqua e i rifiuti, in modo che ci sia sempre una corrispondenza tra quelle che sono eh, le, diciamo, le produzioni nel caso dell'energia o quelle che sono le regole nel caso, di altre, nel caso per esempio dei rifiuti e quello che è la necessità invece del, eh, dell'utenza. What we have implemented in Savona through the Port Authority is a number of things that um, are used to implement the technology um, uh, linked to the future concept of the smart grid, uh, because we think this is the only way of ma making uh, um, the distribution system for electricity and for other sources really work, other sources uh, also involving the fields of water and waste. So um, uh, to build in a way that there will be a correspondence a correspondence between the production and the needs, the production for energy or the rules for uh, waste and the real needs. Ok. Eh, la cosa eh, che deve essere evidenziata è che un porto è un, eh, un luogo dove eh, le, le persone possono variare in maniera incredibile in una giornata, tipo si passa da 800 magari a 20.000 persone in un, in un giorno, proprio perché un porto, oltre al discorso mercantile, ha anche, nel caso di Savona, ma di Genova, ma di tantissimi altri porti, un apporto importante per quanto riguarda i passeggeri, i navi da crociera, traghetti o quant'altro. Quindi eh, fare in maniera che queste persone abbiano una serie di servizi che mediamente sono on demand, cioè non, non si sa prima eh, in maniera molto precisa che cosa, si, cosa eh, il passeggero o cosa il, il mercantile o il marinaio vuole o quello che vuole la nave, si deve essere pronti ad, eh, ad affrontare il servizio, a dare quello che serve eh, in un determinato modo. So um, a port is a complicated place where people change, the number of people being in a port change during the day. They can go to from 800 to 20,000 people according to the cruise ships arriving or to the um, uh, ships, uh, the cargo ships that arrive, the passengers. And so um, it is necessary to make those people have services on demand because they are often, often not foreseeable. And uh, the port must be ready to offer those services on time, just on time and when they are demanded. Il focus sono su tre argomenti che riguardano la distribuzione di acqua, perché eh, sia le navi passeggeri che le navi mercantili hanno bisogno di approvvigionarsi di acqua. Mediamente lo fanno a bordo, però spesso, e qua viene anche fuori il discorso della on demand, spesso hanno bisogno di eh, integrare l'approvvigionamento che fanno a bordo con eh, quello che c'è a terra, quindi vuole un impianto che sia in grado di dare eh, quelle quantità di acqua che vedremo che ha bisogno, di cui ha bisogno le navi. Poi un altro argomento che deve essere affrontato in maniera eh, particolarmente eh, approfondita è il, eh, quello che riguarda lo smaltimento dei rifiuti e l'offerta che deve dare il porto a quelle che sono le domande dal punto di vista del, eh, delle tipologie di rifiuti che può rilasciare una nave. Tenete presente che una nave passeggeri è praticamente una città con tutta una serie di servizi e quindi anche di necessità di eh, smaltimento che ha una città. In ultimo affronteremo il discorso che poi è il più importante dal punto di vista dell'impatto con l'ambiente, anche se i rifiuti ovviamente lo sono, è l'alimentazione elettrica, cioè il dare l'energia che serve per far funzionare il porto, ma in certi casi anche per far funzionare le navi quando sono ferme. Gli obiettivi sono quelli di avere una, eh, 
disponibilità. So um, we will focus on three topics. The first one is water distribution. Uh, cargo ships and passenger ships need water. They normally have a, enough supply on board, but often do need integration from water with land sources. So you need a kind of plant which will supply the needed amount of water in the needed time. Then you have the waste management. The waste management, um, you must remember that a passenger ship, for example, is like a city with varied needs. So the port needs to be able to answer to uh, demands on different waste typologies. And last but not least, in what concerns the environment, electricity uh, is uh, needed to make the port, but also the ships work. So is, is, it's the other important topic that we will see. Come dicevo, gli obiettivi sono quelli di dare un servizio che sia disponibile, che sia efficiente, che sia sostenibile sia dal punto di vista eh, delle procedure, sia dal punto di vista ovviamente dell'ambiente e che purtroppo questa è una necessità perché il, i porti sono un, è un luogo dove, la, eh, diciamo dove il prezzo il servizio e il prezzo sono molto legati e diciamo è importante eh, che il concetto di globalizzazione che ripeto che nel porto ha o la sua eh, espressione nei massimi livelli porti a far sì che il servizio sia anche economicamente valido. So the goal is to give a service which will be available, efficient and sustainable, both from procedures and for the environment point of, point of view. And um, as ports are places where the, the service offered and the price are strongly linked, it is important that the concept of globalization, which is, uh, starts in ports in a sense, brings also an economic sustainability of the services offered. Per quanto riguarda la distribuzione dell'acqua, eh, a Savona l'anno scorso abbiamo fatto, si vede male, ma abbiamo fatto 150.000 metri cubi di, per, di eh, fornitura di acqua alle navi passeggeri e alle navi mercantili, con un, per un totale di 600 operazioni, quindi quasi due operazioni al giorno. E questo lo abbiamo potuto fare grazie a un sistema che abbiamo messo eh, su nel porto che permette di avere sempre una pressione quasi sempre uguale a 7 bar, quello vuol dire praticamente eh, poter dare eh, una quantità d'acqua che supera i 200 metri cubi l'ora, anche perché le navi non stanno tantissimo, stanno al massimo 8 ore, l'hoteling è circa 8 ore e quindi in 8 ore devono fare il massimo di acqua che possono fare. Se noi siamo in grado di dare una pressione elevata abbiamo la possibilità di fornire il servizio che eh, la nave vuole. Però dall'altra parte una pressione elevata vuol dire mettere sotto, eh, sotto stress eh, la distribuzione e quindi con il rischio di aumentare le perdite. Una delle cose più importanti è quella di evitare le perdite di acqua. L'acqua è un bene prezioso e siamo arrivati a scendere eh, al di sotto dei 12, del 12% di, di perdite, che è assolutamente un livello fisiologico. Questo lo possiamo anche fare grazie al fatto che eh, non, la, diciamo, la distribuzione è fatta ad anello, anzi a doppio anello, in modo tale che l'acqua sia sempre in circolazione e quindi non ci siano delle zone dove l'acqua eh, rimane ferma finché non si apre il rubinetto. Questo fa sì eh, che eh, possiamo garantire sempre la possibilità che l'acqua sia potabile in, in maniera assoluta. So in hot concerns, the water distribution, in Savona we have 150,000 cubic meters um, uh, for um, cargo um, because we have uh, almost two, two operations a day for a total of around 600 operations a year. And this we can do thanks to a system which keeps pressure constant at almost seven bar. 
and so that we can give water at more than 200 cubic meters per hour. Um, uh, uh, so um, if a ship, for example, stays eight hours, because usually that's the average time of stay per ship in the port, with the high pressure, it is possible to um, supply the needed service. But on the other hand, having a high pressure puts a strong stress on the distribution system and risks raising the losses and the leaks. And as water is a precious element, we have tried to reach um, the, lower, the lowest possible um, level of uh, leaks. And we have under 12%, which is more or less the physiological level of leaks in the water system. So distribution is made on a double ring basis, uh, which means that water never stops until the tap is opened. So we can guarantee drinkable water all the time. Benissimo. Parlando invece di rifiuti, eh... Uh, tocchiamo un argomento che è eh, ovviamente uno dei problemi più grossi dal punto di vista del, dell'environmental. A Savona abbiamo un sistema che permette di poter eh, smaltire circa nel 2012 sono state 6.000 tonnellate di rifiuti con un eh, recupero pari l'80%. Abbiamo trattato 79 eh, tipi diversi di rifiuti, eh, quindi una quantità e una tipologia piuttosto, piuttosto vasta, piuttosto elevata, ottenendo eh, appunto un risultato direi notevole perché eh, diciamo che città che eh, possano freggiarsi di un 80% di recupero non ce ne sono tante. In particolare noi possiamo eh, recuperare quasi tutti gli elementi che poi in qualche modo vengono ritrasformati, per esempio il vetro, per esempio l'olio di frittura, quello che viene chiamato olio vegetale esausto, eh, che viene poi riutilizzato, viene filtrato e viene riutilizzato per fare biodiesel. Il vetro viene ovviamente recuperato e ritorna vetro, plastica, eh, poi abbiamo alluminio, eh, le batterie all'acido, le batterie al piombo. Sono eh, tutte cose che la tecnologia moderna ci permette di rimettere in condizioni di riservire. E su 600 su 6 su 6000 tonnellate abbiamo mandato in discarica solo 445 tonnellate di rifiuti che poi sono quelli assimilabili agli urbani now in topic of waste one of the main problems of the environment in savona we have a system which consents um in 2012 6000 tons of waste um to be processed and the recycling level goes up to 80 percent uh, we have worked on 79 different kinds of waste and we get a it will get considerable results, um, which few cities have, because we, we as, as I said, get 80% of recycling and reuse. We uh, reuse, for example, glass, which becomes glass again, of course, frying oil, the so-called exhausted vegetable oil, which is used for biodiesel, plastic, aluminum, acid batteries. Um, uh, modern technology really has helped in enabling the reuse of waste. So out of 6,000 tons, only 445 are real waste, which is a level similar to the urban and waste. Parliamo adesso della distribuzione dell'energia elettrica su cui abbiamo fatto i maggiori investimenti. E il porto di Savona assorbe circa eh, 4.160 megawattore all'anno, questo nel 2012, a fronte di una potenza impegnata di 6,5 megawatt. Abbiamo acquistato circa 4.000 megawattore e ne abbiamo prodotti per adesso solo 160, ma li abbiamo prodotti con sistemi che poi vedremo, ovviamente solare e eolico, in prima, in prima battuta. E il problema di un porto 
che ritorna a quello che è il discorso iniziale, è quello di essere pronto a fare dei servizi. Questo vuol dire che io non, non ho una fabbrica che so che consuma quell'energia, ho un qualche cosa che mi può consumare poco o tantissimo a seconda di chi eh, c'è, quindi ci sarà, quando ci sono poche persone si consuma poco, quando ce ne sono tante si consuma tanto. Questo vuol dire, dal punto di vista eh, di impianto, avere una grande potenza a disposizione. Questa grande potenza a disposizione purtroppo eh, comporta avere grandi perdite, perché solo le perdite di trasformazione, anche senza carico, sono una fetta importante, valgono circa il 2%, 2,5%, e questo è un qualcosa che c'è sempre, però noi dobbiamo essere in grado di dare l'energia quando serve. Un, eh, un possibile sviluppo eh, per diminuire questo tipo di, eh, di spreco è quello appunto un giorno di poter gestire eh, l'alimentazione in funzione della domanda con una velocità diversa da quella che abbiamo adesso. Facciamo riferimento adesso ai 160 eh, megawattore prodotti da fonti rinnovabili. So, electrical energy distribution. This is where the Port of the Port Savona has made higher investments. The Port of Savona um, produces, mi aiuti se sbaglio, 4,100, uses 4,160 megawatts uh, per hour uh, per annum. Um, uh, and we have bought 4,000 megawatts and produced 160 with solar and wind power. The problem of a port is, um, as I said at the beginning, that we need to offer services on demand. So it is not a factory where I can plan the use of energy. I need to serve the people who are present in that moment in the port. So the plan must have a big potential and power availability. This means lots of leaks, two, two, two and a half percent, that uh, the energy must be available exactly when needed. So in order to diminish the leaks, Uh, we hope one day to be able to supply energy really on demand with a different kind of speed. Allora, eh, i 160 eh, megawattore che abbiamo prodotto a Savona da fonti rinnovabili vengono principalmente da un impianto eh, di eh, energia solare che è stato posizionato proprio sul tetto del eh, palacrociere, cioè dell'edificio che fa da interfaccia tra le navi e il porto. E il tetto del palacrociere, come potete vedere dalla foto, è fatto in una maniera eh, eh, un po' strana, invece di essere eh, convesso come, tutti gli altri, come quasi tutti i tetti, è concavo. Una, eh, una falda è esposta a sud e l'altra è esposta a nord. Ovviamente quella esposta a nord ha meno funzionalità rispetto alla produzione di energia solare e noi abbiamo risolto il problema utilizzando per, quella, per la falda esposta a sud un, eh, un, il sistema classico a pannelli eh, policristallino che hanno delle caratteristiche eh, di, di resa ovviamente di fronte al sole particolarmente alte. Per la falda esposta a nord abbiamo utilizzato invece dell'amorfo che ha la caratteristica di avere una resa inferiore ovviamente al policristallino ma molto più costante, quindi anche in funzione di luce diffusa o di, di, o di luce non diretta è in grado di produrre. E avendo prodotto l'anno scorso circa 140 megawattore abbiamo ha avuto un risparmio dal punto di vista di emissioni che potete vedere dalla, dalla slide.
So the 160 megawatts produced in Savona last year um, from uh, renewable energy sources were mainly um, originated by a uh, plant of solar energy, which is placed on the roof of the so-called Palacruceri, which is the building um, uh, with which the cruises, where the cruises arrive. You can see it in the picture. It has a strange shape because um, it is uh, more concave than convex, uh, as one of the, the side, one of the parts of the roof faces south and. So so there, it was easier. We used um, the uh, for it was easier for solar uh, power, but the one faces one faces north, and it is less functional. So um, in the south facade, they have used the classical polycrystalline panels with very high results. But for the north, they used amorphous um, uh, system, which has a um, lower results, but is constant even with indirect or low source of light. So the results that um, were obtained last year are shown in the slide. Una prerogativa del porto di Savona è quella di aver fatto una sperimentazione, direi sistematica, sulle eh, varie tipologie. Ci possono essere delle small eh, delle, <coughs> turbine, delle piccole turbine. E perché? Perché in realtà eh, questo tipo di possibilità di produzione da fonti rinnovabili è al mondo attualmente ancora a livello artigianale, cioè in realtà ognuno ha, eh, tantissime nazioni hanno tirato fuori eh, modelli di eh, generatori, di piccoli generatori, eh, cercando di capire se funzionano o non funzionano, mai nessuno ha fatto un lavoro come, eh, di, sistematico e di, eh, poi di messa, poi, come vedremo, eh, di messa a disposizione di tutti in modo che ognuno si faccia anche un po' un'idea di quello che è, può essere la produzione di questo tipo di turbina eh, quello che sembra una cosa molto bella cioè quello di vedere un generatore che gira con poco vento o che, che sembra che produca con, eh, con poco vento in realtà non è eh, così eh, così efficiente, anzi, eh, prima di tutto bisogna tenere presente che poco vento vuol dire poca potenza e quindi anche se una macchina, eh, se un generatore piccolo gira quando c'è un vento molto basso, l'energia che può ricavare è sempre molto limitata. Ci sono due, ti due tipologie che eh, il mercato ha affrontato per queste macchine. C'è la tecnologia ad asse orizzontale, che è quella classica, cioè quella con le classiche tre pale o due pale, che si vede anche per gli impianti più grossi. E c'è la tecnologia ad asse verticale, che è una tecnologia specifica proprio per i piccoli generatori, che eh, ha delle caratteristiche particolari che poi vi dirò, che fanno sì che molto probabilmente questa è la tecnologia che un, verrà ulteriormente sviluppata perché dal punto di vista dei risultati finali è quella che dà la, le massime prestazioni. Il problema più grosso per i generatori eh, eolici di piccola taglia è che sono ovviamente piccoli e quindi sono bassi e hanno delle masse molto limitate, quindi hanno momenti di inerzia molto bassi. Cosa vuol dire? Vuol dire che di fronte a un vento rafficato, e il vento è rafficato a bassa quota, si trovano a affrontare delle situazioni, del, praticamente eh, il, nel giro di 2 o 3 secondi, questo lo abbiamo visto un sacco di volte, ma anche oggi è così, nel giro di 2-3 secondi il vento può passare da quell'altezza da, per esempio, 5 metri al secondo a 15 metri al secondo. Questo vuol dire che in 3 secondi la potenza varia del vento, varia da un valore a 30 volte superiore, perché è il fattore 3, quello che <coughs> la velocità è al cubo e quindi è 30 volte superiore. Una piccola macchina. 
one of the characteristics of the Port of Savona is that it has systematically experimented technologies, for example, micro wind turbines. Why? Because this kind of uh, renewable energy source is presently made in many countries, but it's basically on a handicraft, not on an industrial level. Many countries have produced small generators, but there's none which has made a systematic approach, making all kinds available so that people can get a very precise idea. What appears to be very nice, like seeing a wind plant uh, turning with low wind, is actually not necessarily efficient because low wind means low strength, which means low power and little energy given. The market has basically two kinds of technologies. One is the horizontal axis, which is the one that is typically seen with two or three hands, and the other one is with the vertical axis, which is specific for small generators and which has some peculiar characteristics which probably make the technology giving better results and uh, being uh, the, the, the future um, uh, technology to be developed in the future. The biggest problem for small wind plants is that they are small and limited in the results, and the wind is not constant, especially at low altitudes, so that in two or three seconds it can go from 5 meters per second to 15 meters per second, thus varying uh, the value of 30 times it goes uh, with a square um, of, the, of the wind. Quindi questo fatto cosa, cosa comporta? Che la macchina è sottoposta a uno stress particolarmente elevato ed è una macchina piccola, è una macchina che eh, reagisce in maniera violenta alle variazioni del vento. Questo dal punto di vista nel tempo porta a una necessità di manutenzione molto elevata. E siccome la manutenzione di queste macchine deve essere, deve essere fatta con mezzi esterni che costano, come tempo, come impegno di persone, il risultato finale si rischia di produrre tanto, quello che, tanto quanto si, eh, si spende per manutenzione. Quindi dal punto di vista economico può non essere un vantaggioso. Questo riguarda soprattutto l'asse orizzontale che è molto molto eh, diciamo eh, reattivo nei confronti eh, del vento. This means um, that this change of wind means a very high stress on a very small machine which reacts violently to those wind changes. Therefore, this is translated into very high maintenance costs, which sometimes make the maintenance cost uh, uh, equal the amount of uh, energy produced. And this concerns especially the horizontal axes, which are very reactive to wind. Al contrario, l'asse verticale eh, ha una massa molto maggiore e nella rotazione ha sempre almeno una pala che va contro vento, quindi in qualche modo equilibra e non dà eh, quella reazione che eh, abbiamo invece con l'asse orizzontale. Questo accompagnato dal fatto che non ci sono particolari meccanismi eh, per eh, gestire il vento, cosa che ha l'asse orizzontale, ma solo esclusivamente due cuscinetti, fa sì che la macchina abbia molto, molto meno bisogno di manutenzione e alla fine il costo della manutenzione non incide sul costo della produzione, quindi diventa un sistema che può essere sostenibile. Ci deve essere il vento, ma eh, un impianto ad asse verticale piccolo può dare dei risultati. On the other hand, a small vertical axis plant has more chances of being economically sustainable because um, it always has at least one hand going against wind and is therefore not so, so um, uh, doesn't feel so much the wind changes as the horizontal uh, axis um, the wind power. So using only uh, or in, uh, the rings, uh, ring, rings. Rings. Sorry, rings. Using only rings, it needs less maintenance, and uh, so the costs for maintenance are not so um, heavy on the overall cost, and it is more sustainable. Sul, sul nostro sito www.sbport.it 
potete, potete vedere istante per istante il funzionamento di queste macchine. Ormai sono due anni che abbiamo questa possibilità. Potete anche vedere la produzione dai pannelli solari, ma è importantissimo poter vedere come, funziona, come funzionano queste macchine, anche perché si possono vedere dal punto di vista del webcam, si, possono vedere, eh, si può vedere il vento, si può vedere come producono, cosa producono in rete, cosa producono come macchina. Eh, L'unica cosa che in questo momento, tanto per eh, essere coerenti con quello che ho detto precedentemente, l'asse orizzontale lo abbiamo smontato perché aveva bisogno di una manutenzione importante e quindi non è presente. Ma eh, siccome si può vedere, sul, nel, eh, si può recuperare tutta la, la produzione precedente, si possono fare comunque dei, delle verifiche di quello che è stata la produzione sia dell'uno che dell'altro. Uh, so on the site, on the website, which is uh, www.svport.it, you can see in real time how they work and also how the solar panels work. It is important to see them and you can see them also through the webcams. Now, um, coherently, what was said before about maintenance and horizontal axes, uh, those have, have, are presently being dismantled for maintenance, uh, but you can, however, find the last two years productions uh, in order to confront uh, the, um, uh, the, the results from uh, both, uh, both kinds of uh, small wind power. Per quanto riguarda altri interventi che permettono di risparmiare energia o di renderla più efficiente, abbiamo utilizzato un certo numero di eh, variatori di flusso che permette, questa, questa apparecchiatura permette di intensificare o diminuire il flusso delle lampade attraverso una, una regolazione di tensione in modo tale che in determinati periodi pur avendo una certa illumina, illuminamento la lampada consumi di meno e oltretutto questo sistema di regolazione della tensione fa aumentare anche la vita delle lampade e quindi ovviamente si diminuisce anche la possibilità di, eh, diciamo, di sostituirle e quindi abbiamo meno rifiuti. Questa è una tecnologia ormai consolidata, ma comunque è qualcosa che può dare un aiuto importante al consumo, soprattutto per l'illuminazione notturna, che è una necessità anche dal punto di vista della sicurezza, ma che è ovviamente un costo. Um, other savings in energy are, for example, concerning light, and they have used variators in the flux, in the, in the flow, uh, flow variators, which can sense uh, to intensify or diminish the flow um, of each lamp through tension regulators, so that you can keep it uh, low when it is not important to have a, a high level, and you can keep the same level of light but use less energy thus raising the lifetime of lamps and thus diminishing the number of waste, or the, the amount of waste you produce. It is a consolidated technology, but it is helpful, especially uh, for night lighting, which is necessary for safety and security reasons, but it is very costly. Sempre nell'ambito del risparmio di energia nell'illuminazione, stiamo facendo una sperimentazione su una lampada innovativa, su una più che, più che una lampada è un, eh, un proiettore da torre faro a led è stato il primo ad essere montato perché fino adesso il led per quanto riguarda l'illuminazione pubblica non aveva superato i 16 metri d'altezza le nostre torre faro le torre faro in un porto sono più alte e ha bisogno di lampade di una certa potenza bene Abbiamo sostituito una lampada da 1000 watt al sodio con una lampada, ripeto, di nuova costruzione a LED che ci ha fatto risparmiare 1,4 megawattore in un anno. 
Um, another um, action we have done in saving and what concerns the lights is uh, testing in a very innovative uh, lighthouse, uh, light uh, with lead, and it is very innovative. It, it's the first time in which something that goes over 16 meters is tested. And uh, 1,000 sodium lamp has been substituted. 1,000 so sodium lamp has been substituted with a specifically built uh, LED uh, light, um, giving savings of 1.4 megawatts hour in, an, in one year. In ultimo, in questo caso a Vado Ligure, dove eh, stazione dei traghetti della Corsica Ferris. Abbiamo sviluppato un progetto che in pratica è il primo progetto di cold ironing vero e proprio fatto eh, in Liguria. Abbiamo eh, messo proprio vicino alle navi, eh, si vede dalla fotografia, un, una cabina elettrica di una potenza di 1,5 MW in grado di alimentare fino a 3 mega express, cioè traghetti di grande taglia, traghetti da 1500 persone. È il primo passo, ed è un passo sostenibile per alimentare le navi da terra. Il secondo passo, molto ovviamente, verrà sempre fatto a vado nell'ambito della piattaforma nell'alimentazione delle grandi navi porta container. Questo permette di, ovviamente di diminuire l'emissione da parte delle navi, però in una maniera che sia compatibile anche dal punto di vista di, sia impiantistico e sia anche economico. Ad oggi alimentare le, le eh, grandi navi da crociera da terra è praticamente impossibile se non in casi eh, particolari dove esiste una produzione di energia molto vicina, cioè una grande centrale, perché purtroppo una nave, eh, una grossa nave da crociera consuma circa 10 MWA e quindi sono potenze che sono difficilmente recuperabili on demand. Su Vado abbiamo fatto questa sperimentazione che sta funzionando benissimo, i traghetti sono quando sono fermi sono allacciati alla rete elettrica. Um, last but not least, always in Vado Ligure where the ferry boats for Corsica um, uh, work and uh, approach, uh, they have developed the first real cold ironing project in Liguria. You can see it in the picture. Uh, they have put a cabin of la cabina. 1.5 megawatt, which can feed up to um, 1,500 people, three boats of 1, with 1,500 people. And it is the first step towards a sustainable way of feeding ships from land. The second step always in Vado Libre will be for container ships, always in order to lower the emissions from ships in a, com in a way that will be economically and technically sustainable. Today it is really still difficult because um, except for cases in which there is an energy production plant very near the ship, it is still almost impossible considering the dimensions of big passenger ships which uh, can use up to 10 megawatts uh, and uh, therefore require an amount of energy which is difficult to produce unless it is just directly near the port. Alla fine... E tutti i lavori che eh, abbiamo fatto eh, nel porto di Savona ci hanno portato anche ad avere dei riconoscimenti da parte della FI eh, per quanto riguarda le bandiere blu. Il, la, il nostro porticciolo, che è collegato direttamente al porto, ha avuto dal 2002 e continua ad avere, siamo nel, adesso siamo nel 2013, ce l'aspetteremo anche per il 2013, lo abbiamo avuto anche nel 2012, la bandiera blu. Questo è certamente un riconoscimento dell'impegno che abbiamo profuso, che l'autorità portuale di Savona ha profuso per migliorare ulteriormente quello che è l'impatto eh, del, diciamo, del sistema porto dal punto di vista ambientale. Beh, oltre ad aver avuto una, 
gratificazione da parte della FI? Beh, abbiamo avuto una gratificazione anche da parte del, eh, di un animale, di una, di una ragosta, che abbiamo fotografato, eh, che era presente eh, fino a poco tempo fa all'interno del porticciolo. Questo vuol dire che l'acqua è veramente pulita e questo è un vantaggio. Quella che voi vedete, quei baffi che vedete, è una fotografia fatta da, non da un sub, ma dal sottoscritto che era fuori dall'acqua e, e si vedeva benissimo. Poi ogni tanto ci sia, qualche, ci sia stato anche uno squalo, c'è un po' di gente, che, un, po di gente un po' di animali che ci vengono a, non a ringraziare, ci mancano, ma vengono a vedere che tutto sommato da noi non si sta malissimo. Grazie. So, in the end, all works done in Savona have brought um, acknowledgement and praise, for example, by fee. Uh, Savona has the blue flag, which means clean waters, and the uh, smaller pleasant spot, which is very near the port. And um, they are still expecting it in 2013, they expect to have it. And this is one of the ways in which their big work on uh, trying to improve the impact of the port system for the environment has been acknowledged. But there is also another very important way of acknowledging it. And this is made by the lobster that you saw in the picture um, taken by Mr. Rosasco directly uh, with his camera, so not by a specialized photographer. And the fact that a lobster and uh, recently also a shark are present in the port waters is um, uh, significant, uh, considering that the waters are really very clean. That's it. Uh, one uh, of the main issues uh, in uh, so what, uh, okay. uh, one of the main issues uh, in uh, applying cold ironing technology uh, to rural passenger ships is, um, for instance, uh, the time need the amount of time needed to plug in and to disconnect uh, the vessel to the energy network on land. And uh, did you experience that kind of problem in, in Savoyan ports or, or not? Thank you. Noi alimentiamo, noi alimentiamo i traghetti a 380 volt 50 Hz, quindi non ci sono problemi di collegamento, è una cosa velocissima. E il problema sarebbe eh, se dovessimo, eh, il problema esisterebbe se dovessimo alimentare a 60 Hz. E uno dei problemi purtroppo che ha il cold ironing in Italia è che il 90% delle navi sono a 60 Hz all'interno e quindi eh, c'è bisogno di un convertitore di mezzo per poter alimentare una nave. Ci vuole un trasformatore, un convertitore, un altro trasformatore. La tensione 380 volte è una tensione che è tra virgolette facile da, da, diciamo, da, da gestire. Una nave da crociera comincia ad avere tensioni dell'ordine di 6.000 volt, 6.200 volt, che è molto più pericolosa, è già pericolosa al 380, ma è, molto, è assolutamente pericolosa la mia tensione, quindi ci vogliono dei tempi di, eh, di connessione che sono importanti. Eh, la sua è una domanda molto intelligente, anche perché in effetti porta a una considerazione, e cioè in un caso di hoteling di 8 ore, se ne perdono circa tre per poter fare della connessione. E quindi praticamente il, il, è vero, soprattutto d'estate, può, eh, può essere certamente una diminuzione di emissioni, ma la nave ha la sua massima emissione all'ingresso e all'uscita dal porto e lì non si può fare assolutamente niente. In più si perdono tre ore per collegarlo, il risultato non è diciamo quello, tutto quello che ci si potrebbe aspettare da una tecnologia del genere. Grazie. Um, another question. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, uh, detto che comunque l'elettricità comunque anche. Um, so the 
they feed at 380 volts and uh, so um, sorry. Uh, they connect the ferry boats and feed them at 380 volts. The problem would exist if they had to feed at 60 hertz, as most Italian ships are, which therefore need a transformator, a converter, and another transformator uh, in order to uh, make it feasible. And this means that it takes uh, at least three of the eight hours necessary for the uh, connection lost in making the connection. Now, if you consider that the higher emissions are made by ships entering and exiting the port and you cannot uh, make anything there, uh, it is, uh, there is a big question mark on whether this is really um, the, 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 the chosen future which will diminish the impact on the environment. Yeah, the question was always on coal ironing and um, because uh, it has always been said that uh, the problem with this technology is uh, who has to act first, uh, the ship owners and ship companies or uh, the, the port. So in, in your case, uh, what have you done? Uh, it, the uh, Savona Port Authority uh, pushed and asked to uh, um, uh, Corsica ferries to uh, adopt uh, 50 hertz uh, frequency or uh, it was just a case? A, a case. Okay. Uh, Cosa che Ferris ci guadagna, nel senso che, no, no, l'impianto l'ha ordinato lei, noi l'abbiamo eseguito, un impianto che ha costato 150.000 euro, perché forniamo a 380 volt 50 Hz, quindi non abbiamo problemi che portano un, mediamente un costo di eh, cold ironing a 60 Hz dell'ordine di un milione a megawattora, un milione di euro a megawattora. In questo caso Corsica Ferris risparmia, risparmia un sacco di soldi perché non deve tenere a bordo del personale che in altro modo dove, dove, doveva tenere eh, in manutenzione del gruppo elettrogeno, doveva fare tutta una serie di operazioni che, avendo il collegamento da terra, non sono necessarie. Quindi, alla fine, ne ha un vantaggio anche economico, oltre che ad avere un vantaggio dal punto di vista ambientale, che è assoluto e per tutti, c'è un vantaggio economico da parte della Corsica Paris. Quindi è, non è qualcuno che paga, è qualcuno che ha dei vantaggi, cosa che non succede purtroppo per il per il cold ironing normale. In the case of uh, Vado, the Corsica Ferry ordered the plan and it's gaining by it, not only environmentally, it also has an economic advantage um, because the, the, the plan that uh, the Porta Savona made cost 150,000 euros. And uh, so Corsica saves on the personnel it would need on board to maintain and, and, and uh, keep and uh, uh, make the electrogenous group work. Uh, it would be very, very different to um, uh, work with um, uh, big ships uh, uh, giving 380 volts, 50 hertz. So that would be a big problem because the cold ironing cost about 1 million euros per megawatt hour. So it would make it probably not economically advantageous. Hello, good afternoon from Spain. From Spain, do you hear us? No. Hello? No? Yes. Can you hear us? No? Yes? So. More or less? Okay. Uh, more or less. More or less. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, we can we hear have... you. Okay. Uh, we have, it's, it's just a curiosity more than a question. We would like to know if you have any problem with the seagulls. Uh, uh, related with the uh, solar cells and all, all that stuff, and if, uh, if it has any something with, uh, to be with the manten maintenance uh, prices, because if you have problems with the seagulls, uh, you have to clean or you have to pay, uh, you have more cost uh, to maintain that facility, and we would like to know if you have any kind of, that, of problem or, or there is none. Thank you. Okay. 
Allora, sì. eh, su Pala Crociere abbiamo, abbiamo sperimentato due sistemi per eh, tenere lontani i gobiani dalle, dai pannelli che ovviamente possono risentire in maniera importante delle deiezioni. Il primo è stato un sistema acustico che ha funzionato per un po', però non ha dato i risultati sperati. Nel secondo abbiamo messo una specie di, eh, di rilevazione, cioè è un rilevatore che fa in maniera che quando un gabbiano si posa sui pannelli parte un sistema di irrigazione, perché è un sistema di irrigazione che spruzza dell'acqua a pressione e spaventa il gabbiano. Il gabbiano se viene toccato da qualcosa scappa. Da quel momento non abbiamo avuto più problemi. Il vento è un problema dei gabbiani, nel senso che se per... non è mai successo purtroppo che un gabbiano si sia messo eh, in mezzo alle pale. Sono, stanno ben distanti, anzi certe volte se, pal... se il gabbiano se... avrei avuto, non ce l'ho dietro una fotografia di un gabbiano che si era messo sulla, sulla pala ferma, e... però non c'è mai stato un caso di eh, un gabbiano che è stato ferito o meglio ammazzato da, un, da una pala. Uh, so, uh, the, the first part of the question on, on uh, the, sun, the solar panels on the Pala Crociere, the building you saw, they have experimented two systems against seagulls. The first one, because of course the seagulls um, and excrement on the, do the excrements on the wound them. So the first one was an acoustic system which scared them, but it only worked for a bit. So then they implemented a sensor that when a seagull uh, stands on a solar panel, an irrigation system uh, sprinkles high pressure water and the seagull immediately gets scared and goes away. So they are not having any problem with that. Concerning the wind, <laughs> Mr. Zako says that unluckily no seagulls have been killed by the wind plants because they themselves are scared, so they go away from them directly. Okay, thank you very much. Just a curiosity. Uh, as you know, uh, to reduce the impact of the ship emission, uh, many people are looking at uh, LNG. What's your feeling uh, as concern uh, LNG? And uh, do you think that uh, LNG could be a choice uh, uh, for the Sabona port? No. no, no, io penso che l'unica possibilità per diminuire drasticamente le emissioni sia quella di avere dei motori, per le grosse navi parlo, che utilizzino un combustibile in praticamente con l'assenza di zolfo. Questa è la soluzione. Altre soluzioni sono tutte impraticabili dal punto di vista economico. E, mh, scusi, l'unica possibilità di fare un, un qualcosa di economicamente sostenibile è quella legata, come ho detto prima, alle, non alle navi passeggeri ma alle navi porta container, perché le navi porta container hanno dei concetti diversi, hanno delle facilità, delle facilità diciamo di, di allaccio diverse e alla fine anche dei tempi di stazionamento diversi, dove conviene a questo punto l'allacciamento, proprio conviene nel senso che spendono di meno o comunque spendono uguale. Non essendoci una normativa che vale per tutti i porti, un porto che si dotasse di qualsiasi sistema di alimentazione dalle navi da terra in maniera indipendente rischierebbe di perdere il traffico. So, um, the answer to the LNG 
applicability question is that um, uh, the only chance to really diminish emissions drastically is to have engines, uh, to have big ships uh, use engines that use oil with no sulfur uh, inside. <clears throat> he doesn't see any other solution economically feasible at the time being. The only chance to make something economically sustainable is linked not to passenger but to container ships because uh, the, path of the container ships have different connection ways, uh, have different times, and so it might be convenient. They might spend uh, not less, but more or less the same. But if there is no law uh, concerning ports, and a port uh, does this independently, it risks losing its, traf it tra its traffic if it imposes uh, cold ironing and on ships, uh, and there is no national law or European law forcing them to have so. We would like to know um, if you have any uh, compensatory measures for CO2 emission impact. I'm sorry, we can't hear you properly. Can you speak a little bit louder? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me better? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, do you have any compensatory measures for the CO2, uh, CO2 emissions impact? Eh, emissioni da parte di eh, emissioni da parte di chi? Compensatory measures by whom? Um, like uh, more a little bit with the um, biodiversity or something related with uh, because I see these uh, kind of measures more like a preventive uh, um, CO2 emissions, but uh, like if um, after you of course you you have some some emissions so. If you also have some measures that compensate that emissions that you produce. I'm sorry, the, you are talking about the measure to compensate the CO2 uh, emission produced by the ship tanks. Huh? By whom? Uh, by the port, and, and yeah, by the port. That's yeah, it's, it's not a preventive measure, it's a corrective or a compensatory measure. No. Okay. Sorry, could, you, could you make the question in Spanish because we are not understanding it. <laughs> Perdona, sí. um, o sea, lo que quiero preguntar es eh, si tenéis medidas compensatorias a eh, los efectos que se producen con las emisiones de CO2, es decir, con la actividad portuaria. Eh, esas, eh, esas emisiones, si luego tenéis algunas medidas, por ejemplo, en, eh, en el tema de biodiversidad o en, uh, o sea, bueno, principalmente, por ejemplo, con, en temas de plantas o temas de, de, de animales, o, eh, o sea, si, si realmente hacéis alguna medida para corregir esos efectos negativos que estáis teniendo en el medio ambiente. Ma, la, allora, dal punto di vista di, di compensazioni l'unica cosa che noi cerchiamo di fare è quella di diminuirle compensarle è un, è un discorso che può essere diciamo eh, relativamente efficace nel senso che certamente dal punto di vista di effetto della presenza di CO2, il fatto di compensarle facendo delle, delle zone eh, di eh, magari di piantagione di, di, di alberi o di, di quant'altro, a parte che la Liguria è una delle terre più boscose eh, che ci sono in, eh, in Italia, ma questo no, ce l'abbiamo già, ecco, esiste già il problema. Il discorso è ritengo di 
breve, in questo modo uno non risolve il problema, cioè quello della produzione di, di CO2, ma lo eh, ne, ne crea, diciamo, fa in maniera che una quota parte possa essere in qualche modo recuperata. C'è qualcuno che voleva anche fare un sistema, soprattutto <coughs> per le centrali termiche, di mettere eh, la CO2 sottoterra. Non sono queste eh, le soluzioni, le soluzioni sono quelle di fare in maniera che si diminuisca la produzione e penso che la strada più percorribile sia quella di razionalizzare i consumi o di renderli compatibili attraverso dei sistemi di storage. Questo potrebbe essere storage dell'energia ovviamente, questo potrebbe essere una soluzione. Uh, no, from the point of view of compensation, uh, the real compensation is trying to diminish the emissions of CO2 because compensation would be relatively efficient as you could you could you would keep on having the presence of CO2. So planting trees, for example, is not a real measure in the Guria, the region of the Guria, which is one of the most highly uh, wooded uh, um, uh, regions of Italy. Um, so um, he thinks that it is not a, a street that you need to choose because you do not really solve the problem, which is solved only in diminishing the production of CO2. Someone wanted, had proposed making a system for thermal centers capturing CO2 underground, but the real solution is lowering the production. The best way is rationalizing the use and making it compatible through energy storage. Okay, thank you very much. Grazie a tutti.